All right. So exam five covers um, chi-squared, binomial tests, confidence intervals. For chi-squared, there are two different types, a goodness of fit and a test for independence. Um, <clears throat> so the purpose of a chi-squared distribution is comparing a set of observed frequencies to an expected distribution. Um, it's always positive. The value for chi-squared is always positive. You'll never have a negative value. Um, and it is positively skewed, meaning the tail points towards the positive side of the distribution. Um, so characteristics are, it's positively skewed, the it's non-negative, and it's based on the degrees of freedom. So when the degrees of freedom change, a new distribution is created. So this is what it looks like with one degree of freedom. This is three, five, and then 10. So as your degrees of freedom increase, your distribution is going to be becoming more normal. And your degrees of freedom are based on the number of categories you have. So for a goodness of fit test, you're going to be comparing uh, observed frequencies to expected. And we use it to formally test for a relationship between these two nominal variables. So I've noticed in the past a lot of people get confused about interpreting or making a decision on um, chi-square and they always say that yes it was you reject the null hypothesis they were correlated no 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 they're not correlated and they are related but correlation is strictly for when you have interval and ratio level data Chi-square is for nominal level data. So you can't say if your chi-square is significant that they're correlated, but you definitely say that they are related. So just be careful and read carefully the, the options for the decisions. So F sub zero or sub O is your experience. Uh, observed frequencies, F sub E is your expected frequencies. Um, your hypothesis for a goodness of fit test, the null is that there is no difference between the observed and expected frequencies. The alternative is that there is a difference. They, they aren't the same. So if we were going to do a hypothesis test, we would go through the same steps that we have previously. You're going to state your null and alternative hypotheses. You're going to identify the test statistic. You're going to spell out the rule of rejection, um, compute it, the statistic, and then make a decision about the null, whether to accept or reject the null. This is the equation. And all you do here is however many categories there are, you take your observed, subtract your expected, square that, difference and divide it by the expected and then for you do that for every category and sum all those up so um, your degrees of freedom like I said earlier are based on the number of categories where k is the number of categories and your df is just one minus the number of categories you have so here's an example um, the owner of Bubba's Fish and Pasta is considering adding steak to his menu, but before doing so, he hired a research company to conduct a survey of adults of their favorite meal when eating out. So they sampled 120 adults and asked them, what meal do you prefer? And they, the manager wants to know, or the owner wants to know, if there is a preference among his entrees. So first we state the null and alternative hypothesis. The null is there's no difference between observed and expected, or you could put it in terms of the scenario that you're given. So for this one, people have no preferred meal. 
Um, the alternative is that there is a difference between the observed and expected, so people do have a preferred meal. Um, select a level of significance. It's usually stated in the problem, and alpha equals 0.05 is usually what it is. Select the test statistic, test statistic and it's going to be a chi-square because we have nominal level data. That's pretty much all we can do. Um, and we're going to use this equation. So for this example, we have four different entrees, chicken, fish, meat, and pasta. So our degrees of freedom are going to be 4 minus 1, so 3. And at alpha of 0.05, you're going to have a critical value of 7.8. Or 7.815. So if our chi-square value falls over here, we're going to reject. If it's anywhere in this big part, the body of the distribution, we will not. And we were given our observed preferences for the meals, our FO. Um, because we were not given any proportions, so sometimes you'll be given a, a, a question where it says, you know, um, the one he used in class was a grade distribution. So in the past, there was 30% A's, 20% B's. If you're given something like that, then that is an unequal expected frequency goodness of fit test. This is an equal expected frequencies goodness of fit test. So you take the total number of people surveyed, which is 120, and divide it by 4, and that will give you your expected frequencies of 30 for each category. Then you just plug your numbers into your equation. Um, you subtract your observed minus your expected, and then square it for each category and then divide those by the expected frequency. So here, for the equal expected frequencies, your denominator will always be the same. It changes for the unequal expected frequencies. And can I resolve that? So our chi-square comes out to 2.2, and it is obviously not greater than 7.815, so our decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the people that were sampled did not have a preference in meal. Our observed matched our expected, and what difference we did find between the categories is just chance differences. So, Here's another one that is equal expected frequencies. So home team advantage, I think he did this one today in class. And um, so of the 64 games, 42 were won by home teams. And is this enough evidence to suggest that the home team does have an advantage? So. Um, there were 64 games. We divide that by the two different categories. So that gives you 32 for your expected frequencies for both categories. And our null hypothesis is that there is no home team advantage. And our alternative is that there is. And our rejection rule, because there's only two categories, our degrees of freedom is one and the value is 3.841. So we plug in our numbers to our equation. Okay. And um, we get a value of 6.25, meaning 
there is a significant difference between a, a reserved and expected and that there is a home team advantage. So unequal expected frequencies. Um, the hypotheses, the rejection rule, all stays the same. Everything, the formula stays the same. The only difference is now we are going to calculate our expected frequencies differently. So here you're given 40% um, are not admitted to a hospital, 30% are admitted once, 20% are admitted twice, and the remaining 10% are admitted three or more times. So of a survey of 150 residents of this hospital or senior, senior citizens residents revealed that 55 were not admitted, 50 were admitted once, 32 were admitted twice, and the rest of those in the survey were admitted three or more times. So based on this, can we conclude that the American Hospital Administrators Association, um, their percentages for admitted into hospitals during a one-year period is the same as this senior's home in Florida. So our hypothesis is that there is no difference between the local numbers and the national numbers for hospital admissions. And the alternative is that there is a difference. Uh, our level of significance was 0.05 stated in the problem. Our degrees of freedom, we have four categories, so it's going to be three. And our test statistic is going to be chi-squared. And the critical value is 7.815. So here are our numbers. And... Our observed numbers come from the senior citizens' home, what they reported. And the national numbers come from the American Hospital Association. And then the expected numbers are based on the percentages. So they said that 40% nationally are admitted to a hospital once. So you take your total number of people sampled, which is 150, and multiply it times 0.4. And that will give you your expected frequencies of 60. And you do that for the other three categories. That gives you your other expected frequencies. If your expected total doesn't match your observed total, you made a calculation error. So it's a good way to check. And then we compute the chi-squaring. So here are your observed minus your expected, which also should always equal zero. And then squared those values and divided them by your expected. So here, your denominator is going to be different based on whichever category you're in. So you need to make sure and match, match them up. So for your first one, it's going to be 55 minus 60 squared divided by 60. For this one, um, it's going to be 50 minus 45 squared divided by 45. So you just have to be real careful and keep your numbers together. And our calculated chi-square is only 1.37, which is nowhere near our critical region. So we don't reject, and the difference between the observed and expected frequencies is due to chance or sampling error. Um, so, yeah. There's no evidence of difference between the local and national experience of hospital admissions. Now we have K-12 
contingency table analysis, which is also called a test, a uh, chi-square test for independence. Um, and a contingency table is used to investigate whether two traits or characteristics are related. So each observation is classified in two ways versus one way. The, the goodness of fit only has one classification, meal preference, hospital admittance. Contingency table or test for independence, it will always have two or more. Um, but for our test, it's only going to have two. So our degrees of freedom are calculated differently. It's now the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. And our expected frequencies are cal calculated differently. So that is going to be your row total times your column total divided by the grand total. And so we use this to formally test a relationship between two nominal scaled variables. Put it another way, it's is one variable independent of the other? So Ford Motor, Motor Company runs an assembly plant in Dearborn, Michigan. The plant operates three shifts per day, five days a week. The quality control manager wishes to compare the quality level on three shifts. Vehicles are classified by quality level acceptable or unacceptable, and the shift is classified three ways as day, afternoon, and night. Is there a difference in the quality level on the three shifts? That is, is the quality of the product related to the shift when it was manufactured? Or is the quality of the product independent of the shift in which it was manufactured? So that's one example of how it would be set up, what it would look like. Um, a sample of 100 drivers who were stopped for speeding violations was classified by gender and whether or not the drivers were wearing a seatbelt when they stopped. Um, so for this one, is wearing a seatbelt related to gender? Does, male, does a male released from federal prison make a different adjustment to civilian life if he returns to his hometown or if he goes elsewhere to live? The two variables are adjusted, adjustment to civilian life in place of residence. So all of your variables will be nominal level variables. And the example we're going to do is the prison life adjustment or civilian life adjustment after prison. So the agency psychologist randomly interviewed 200 former prisoners and using a series of questions, they classified the adjustment of each individual to civilian life as outstanding, good, fair, or unsatisfactory. The classifications for the 200 former prisoners were tallied as followed. Um, and then it gives a one specific person So it won't be shown like the top. It will be actual numbers, not tallies. And um, so here are your calculations for your counts of how many prisoners went to their hometown and were rated as outstanding. It was 27, and then 13 were not going back to their hometown after release. So we're going to state our null and alternative hypotheses that null, there is no relationship between adjustment to civilian life and where the individual lives after being released from prison. And then the alternative is that there is a relationship between adjustment to civilian life and where the individual lives after being released. Our level of significance is alpha equals 0.01, and it was stated in the problem. Our test statistic is going to be chi-squared. And our equation stays the same as a test for independence. I mean, for a goodness fit. You're just going to have a lot more of them to sum. So to 
calculate our expected frequencies, we're going to use this formula right here, row total times column total divided by grand total. So here is our column total, 40. And if we wanted to calculate the expected frequency for hometown and outstanding, we are going to multiply 40 times... 120 divided by 200 and that will give you 24 and then you would need to do that for every number in this matrix so 35 were rated as good and went to their hometown to get that expected frequency of 30 you multiply 50 times 120 divided by 200 and to get 13 they went to somewhere other than their hometown but were rated as outstanding it'd be 40 times 80 divided by 200 does that make sense to everybody okay. and what I always do is I always like draw a line in the cell of the matrix and put the expected frequency to the right of it just so I can keep them straight. So then it's worked out. So you also have to be mindful of keeping your expected frequencies together, your denominator matching what's in your numerator. So you do, you, you know, subtract 20, 24 minus 27, 27 minus 24 squared divided by 24, 35 minus 30 squared divided by 30. Go all the way through every, all six cells and sum them and you get 5.729. So our critical value is 11.345 and remember that that is calculated differently also it is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one and then you just look in the table and pick out that value. Which 5.729 is in the area of not rejection. So we would fail to reject the null hypothesis and um, determine or conclude that there's no evidence to support a relationship between your place of residence and adjustment to civilian life after um, prison. So that is the end of chapter 15, I think. And that brings us to chapter 18. So confidence in intervals for a proportion. So these are examples of nominal scales of measurement. A career service director at Southern Technical Institute reports that 80% of its graduates enter the job market in a position related to their field. A company representative claims that 45% of Burger King sales are made at the drive through window. A survey of homes in the Chicago area indicated that 85% of new construction had central air conditioning. Only 85%? A uh, recent survey of married men between ages 35 and 40, uh, or 50, found that 63% felt both partners should earn a living. So, if we wanted to do a confidence interval around proportions, which all of these are examples of proportions, um, we would need our sample proportion, so here be 63%, so for the last, for number four. So our proportion would be 0.6 for our sample, 
0.63 for a sample proportion. And this is the formula we're going to use for the confidence interval. So this would be P, lowercase p is your sample proportion. Z is the um, critical value you're going to multiply times this guy, which is your error. So the Z value you'll find on the T table on the infinity line, the very last line, over 200. And so that way you don't have to go back to your Z table and worry about that. So here's an example. Suppose a random sample of 2,000 current union members reveals that 1,600 plan to vote for the merger proposal. Using the 95 degree of confidence, what is the interval estimate for the population proportion? And then base your decision on the sample information. Can you conclude that the necessary proportion of I don't know what BBA stands for, some union, um, members favor the merger and why. So our sample proportion is going to be that 1,600 that support the merger uh, over 2,000, and that will give us 0.8. And then you find the Z value for 95 percent confidence interval, and then you compute the confidence interval. So for a 95 percent confident, it will be 1.96, and confidence intervals are always two-tailed. So we plug in our 0.8 right here, and we plug in our 0.8 right here and right here, and then n is going to be your total number of people sampled or widgets, and you work this out first, what is under the square root. Take the square root of that, multiply that by 1.96, which gives you 0 0.018. And then you subtract 0 0.018 from 0.8, and then add 0 0.018 to 0.8. And that will give you this 95% confidence interval of 0.782 to 0.818. So, test concerning proportion. And proportion is the fraction or percentage that indicates the part of the population or sample having a particular trait of interest. The sample proportion is denoted by P, and it's found by X divided by P. So, in this last example, X would have been the 1,600 people that would have supported the merger, and N would be your 2,000 sample. And so... The test of hypothesis for a one proportion is a z-test. And here your p is going to be your sample proportion. Pi is going to be your population proportion that's given in the question. It will be given to you. And just make sure that you put pi in the denominator here and not your sample proportion like the confidence interval. So for the confidence interval, it's p times 1 minus p divided by n, and then you take the square root. For the hypothesis test, it's pi times 1 minus pi over n, and then you take the square root. So um, these, this, so we're, you're only going to be tested on two-tailed tests for proportions. So it will always be this. The value will be given for the population proportion will be given in the question. 
and the null will always be that pi equals that value and the alternative is that pi does not equal that value. And then you would reject the null if your z statistic, the absolute value of your z statistic is greater than your critical value. And the directional hypotheses are written the same way as we did earlier in the semester when we were doing directional hypothesis. But for this test, don't worry about that. So this slide just explains what everything is, like I already did. And here is an example. So prior elections, the incumbent governor is interested in assessing his chances of returning to office by um, assessing whether her chances are different from 80%. That just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, she plans to conduct a survey that sampled 2,000 potential voters in the northern part of the state, which revealed that 1,550 plan to vote for the incumbent governor. governor, governor. <laughs> Using the hypothesis testing procedure at an alpha of 0.05, um, assess the govern, governor's chances of re-election. So this 80% is your population proportion. So 0.8 will be pi. 1,550 divided by 2,000 will give you your sample proportion, p. So we have our null and alternative hypotheses. Pi equals 0.8, and pi does not equal 0.8. Um, and you'll see in all these questions that are like this, it will say different or differ, different from. So look for that keyword, even though you don't really have to, because they will always be two-tailed. So, but those are the keywords that indicate to tailed problems. Our alpha level is 0.05, and we are going to use the Z statistic to test this. Um, you don't really need to worry about this part. The N times 1 minus pi is greater than or equal to 5. Um, and step 4, our critical Z value will be found on our t-table at the infinity line with, for two-tailed, you just look in the 0.05 column and it is 1.96. So, that's what it's gonna look like. So then you plug in your numbers. So we've got 1,550 divided by 2,000, which is your population, uh, your sample proportion, and then sub you subtract your population proportion from that, and you plug in your pi in your denominator and your sample size, and once this is worked out, you would get a value of a negative 2.80 which is greater than our 1.96. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis and say that there is evidence that the governor will receive less than 80% of the votes in the northern section of the state. And the less part is because our Z statistic is negative. But you could just say she won't receive the amount of votes. And that's it. Does anybody?